cover. So, at the launch, the lead oil and gas analyst at uh, HSBC said, and I paraphrase, but accurately, you know what, we don't question these numbers, this is right. And if you combine it with the performance of these big oil companies and their profitability, you look at their last quarter results, they're shocking. Uh, Shell had to write off $2 billion in U.S. shale. If you didn't know that, that's a very important fact. They've written it off from a $20 billion investment in shale. This is a boom? This is the future? I don't think so. Not in the face of that kind of thing. They came in late, they got the low-grade plays, and they got whacked in the face because the narrative just leapt up and, and slapped them. Very important argument, anyway. I don't. So, uh, the oil crisis, finally, uh, is the last one. Um, the basic argument here, again, there are two very different narratives. We're drowning in oil, or we're just about to run out of oil. Neither is true, those of us who worry think. Um, here are the military views that uh, we do have a problem, and that the American military, the British military, and the German military have all said that. Uh, and Americans are acting on it. They have one of the biggest renewable and renewable fuel <coughs> programs that you can imagine. In Britain, we have an industry view on this, and a, a pan-industry task force that even SSE are members of, Virgin, Stagecoach, and we said in, in 2010, don't let the oil crunch catch us the way the credit crunch did. That's still the view that we have, despite the narrative that we're offered um, from the industry. So, let me conclude, uh, because we're now at the time for the coffee break at 10 o'clock, and I'm sorry about missing your questions, but we have a panel afterwards. I think there are a number of conclusions I draw from all this, and they'll be pretty obvious to you that um, our future in the energy industry in this decade is going to be defined, whatever we manage to do with rational policy making, it's going to be defined by shocks. A shock or shocks. And that's what I conclude in the book. I think the most likely one is going to come from a collapse in global oil production, not because there isn't plenty of oil, but because of what they put in place in the way of being able to deliver flow rates at anything like the kind of demand levels that we're going to have, given what's happening particularly in India and China and the Middle East. Really rapid growing um, consumption of, of oil in these places. So, as regards the climate objective, we should keep going, um, aiming at that climate summit in December 2015, with everything that we can do to strengthen the arm of Christina Figueres uh, and the Climate Secretariat. She has the most difficult job in the world. Uh, we may or may not, in the interim, have to face another of these shocks. It could be the financial system going again, or if I'm right, it could be the um, oil crash. And that, of course, will make things a lot worse before they get better, but it will give us a time of opportunity to really ram home these arguments, but there is a way to get out of this that doesn't involve doing more of exactly the kind of thing that got us into the problem in the first place. And that's what's happened so far with the financial crisis. That will really give us the chance to <coughs> hold our leaders' feet to the fire and um, get them to, once and for all, go down the climate solver route on the road to renaissance. And thank you very much for listening to that. Can stand up, please introduce yourself. Are you sure? I'm very sure. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. Hi, I'm Pat Olofsson with Climate Well. So I'm interested in about what you said about the, the peak, uh, well, the oil risk, essentially, because what, what we've seen in Brazil in the last couple of months is essentially with the Batista Empire totally falling down, from almost at 50 billion down to half a billion dollars. Is that just, um, how should I say, it? Uh, is, has it nothing to do with it? Was it just an unfortunate valuation of assets, or is it connected to what you're saying here? I mean, essentially, they couldn't get the oil out of the ground and the gas fast enough to, to motivate the valuation. Yeah, um, that, and that, I suppose, I don't know the, um, I don't have a considered opinion about the inward working of that uh, Batista story, but that's the general problem that they have. And their ability to switch to myth and propaganda 
is their own worst enemy here. So what you would hear if there was someone here from the oil industry is that this is ridiculous. There's so much oil in these reserves. We, we have 40 years of supply, they say. And this is, of course, the amount that they've configured as reserves divided by the current production rate. Uh, and it misses so many things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the deliverable flow rates, how quickly you can yeah. get it up out of the ground. And then, you know, when you talk to people who believe the incumbency narrative, say at dinner parties, and they don't really know uh, about what's going on, a couple of test questions is, you know, how, how long does it take once they've found one of these oil fields that they read about in the newspapers, giant oil field found off Brazil. Mm. How long is it going to take them to bring that to market? You know, it's more than 10 years. Uh, and the average is actually six years, even for smaller fields. And then another one about this boom in America, the oil shale, or tight oil as it's properly called, boom in America, which has got even the IEA saying, you know, hey, we're on the way to Saudi America, America's going to be self-sufficient, it's all going to be great. Um, and then you ask people, well, you know, how, how much is that, uh, is that boom? And the answer is just over 2 million barrels a day in a 91 million barrel a day world in which the old crude fields are already depleting off a peak at 74, 75 million barrels a day and descending at 6% a year. And you know, when people say, what? Crude oil has peaked, actually already peaked? Yes, ask the IEA. But you never read it in the, in the newspapers. So do you see what I mean? This is the constant thing that I encounter in going about um, you know, my, my work. And um, this is what we have to try and combat as best we can. Great, thanks, Jeremy. And our last question, um, and as uh, we mentioned, there'll be time for more questions after the panel discussion. Morning, Andrew Schliekman here. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting account. Uh, like you, I, I have tried to um, follow this all this debate, in particular in the US, about the, the so-called shale revolution. Um, and, and, I, and I tend to agree with you that I, I, I see this as a, as a huge bubble. But, but the counter-argument, of course, is all these big energy companies, they must have a number, a great number of analysts. Are they really uh, wrong, all of them? I mean, the, 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 how, how can you explain that these big companies are investing so much energy, time uh, and efforts? Uh, I'm just perplexed that, that, that the assessments can be so widely different. It is, um, it is perplexing, um, but I think there, there are two things. It would be much more difficult to believe if we hadn't seen it with the financial crisis. And the answer there was, how could all those analysts be wrong? All those analysts who were giving the investment banks you know, great ratings, buy, buy, buy. All the ratings agencies who were giving them AAA you know, ratings for their complex derivatives. Uh, and that all happened. And they were all wrong, and they nearly created the world economy, uh, the, the global economy. Mm -hmm. So we always have to remember that, and we always have to remember this thing about the male bullshit. So you know, in the dot com crash, you know, all the forensics of that uh, are, have long since come out, and you know, people have served their time in jail over over what happened there. All the memos, the emails that came out, one of them, the memorable one about this stock is such a heap of crap. And that was from the same investment bank that was madly hyping, uh, it, persuading its clients to buy it. Um, and there's countless stuff like that in the financial crisis as well, some of which I distill in the book. So w w we, we trust at our great peril, these big institutions. It's not to say that everyone is bad in them, and I'm going to finish on an up note by saying, who are the analysts now in Carbon Tracker? In the first report, they were these people, the founders, who um, were brave enough to leave the financial sector and start this work. Now there's uh, an analytics unit that is run by the former head of research at Citi um, and the lead oil and gas analyst at Deutsche Bank, Mark Lewis, has left Deutsche Bank to work for Carbon Tracker. So when you create the, you know, the institutional apparatus for people to be good guys, as opposed to just sit there and 
continue to be on the dark side, then some of them will do it 